This is Lin Biao, Communist China's Vice Premier and Minister of Defense. Not long ago, he told the world of Red China's strategy for communist conquest of the free world. It is a blueprint for world revolution. Red China's battle plan. Divide and encircle. Conquer and enslave. This film tells how it all came about. The China of old is but dimly remembered, and yet modern China is heir to the world's oldest culture, a culture that first flowered 5,000 years ago. In the third century BC, three million Chinese labored to build the Great Wall. And in that same century, China became the world's first police state, complete with slave labor and thought control. By 700 AD, China was the greatest nation on earth in area, population, government, and intellectual growth. 600 years later, Marco Polo traveled to Peking to serve in the court of Kublai Khan. Then it began, the decline and fall of imperial China. Hostile, suspicious, isolated, China clung stubbornly to ancient ways as the old world and the new moved into and passed through the Industrial Revolution. China, backward, defenseless, impotent, became easy prey for the world powers who by wars, threats of wars, and exploitation stripped away territories and trading rights. In 100 years, China ceased to dominate various territories, which included three and one half million square miles, an area equal in size to three Indias, or almost all of Europe. Never in history had a major independent nation lost so much sovereignty and suffered so much humiliation. Entering the 20th century, China is a backward nation ruled by an autocratic system of emperors and kings. Her people are restless. They want to change. They demand new leadership. They find both in Dr. Sun Yat-sen, the George Washington of China who leads a people's revolution in 1911 that overthrows the corrupt Manchu dynasty. Dr. Sun's attempts to establish democracy in China are hampered by reactionaries, restorationists, warlords. And amid the chaos and unrest, the Chinese Communist Party is born. Mao Zedong attends the founding conference in 1921. A man of the soil, he believes that the ultimate power in China belongs to the peasants who make up 80% of the nation's population. And so, says Mao Zedong, China's communist revolution must begin in the rural areas and sweep over the cities. Chiang Kai-shek Succeeding Sun Yat-sen works with the communists at first, but in 1927 he purges them from his government. Chiang's armies are able to drive the red troops into the mountains, but he can never wipe them out. And in 1934, Mao Zedong undertakes his long march in search of sanctuary in the remote province of Shenzhi, in the caves of Yan'an. It is as if an army had been ordered to march on foot 6,000 miles through hostile territory in one year. 
following a tortuous roundabout route, the communists cross 18 mountain ranges, some of them higher than the European Alps. In the beginning, there are 180,000 marchers in the communist caravan, curling across the hills and plains of China for 50 miles and more. Casualties are enormous. Three quarters of the marchers die en route. But the survivors press on, and when they reach their mountain sanctuary, Mao himself is on hand to salute and welcome them. He is and has been throughout the long march in full command. There are only a few thousand communists in the caves of Yan'an, but from this humble beginning, their influence will grow and multiply, reach out and conquer. The communists ideologically are constantly on the attack denouncing the nationalist government and Chiang Kai-shek. And Mao does something no military leader in China has done before. He sends his soldiers into the fields to work beside the peasants, to help them, and to talk to them of the new China, the communist China, in which landlords will be made to give up their farms to the peasants. Propaganda teams travel the countryside. Dancers perform morality plays in which the landlords are the devils and the communists are the forces of righteousness, trampling their class enemy. Chiang Kai-shek is aware of the growing pro-communist sentiment in China. He realizes that it is a threat as great, if not greater, than the aggressive ambitions of the Japanese. For Chiang and for nationalist China, the sands of time are running out. And yet, the nation, her cities, and her people reflect little of the uneasiness, unrest, uncertainty that cast their shadows from within and without. The blow falls. Japan strikes. When Chiang Kai-shek is forced into war with Japan, when China must fight for her life, the communists are given representation in a coalition government. Mao Zedong makes his real aims very clear. We are fighting 70% for self-development, 20% for compromise, 10% against Japan. As the Sino-Japanese War goes on, Mao is promoted in Chinese communist propaganda as a popular anti-Japanese patriot. Wherever and however the Red Troops move into battle, they spread the glory of Mao Zedong and the greatness of the communist cause. On their backs, they carry posters and slogans as they march through the countryside. When the war ends in 1945, Mao's guerrillas have grown from 40,000 to 1 million. The enemy from without has been conquered, but within, the fight has just begun. For post-war China is a nation exhausted by battle. People eat grass, misery and hunger are deeply etched on the land and on the people. This is the time for Mao Zedong to launch his so-called War of National Liberation. 
communist forces have been strengthened by the acquisition of captured Japanese weapons and ammunition, stockpiled in Manchuria and seized with Russian assistance. Mao's strategy is based on a protracted war, a war that will weaken the nationalists as the communists grow stronger. Enemy advances, we retreat. Enemy camps, we harass. Enemy tires, we attack. Enemy retreats, we pursue. Time and again, Chiang Kai-shek's stronger, better equipped army units find themselves fighting an elusive, shadowy enemy that melts into the mountains. And in the midst of battle, communist soldiers harangue the nationalists calling on Chiang's troops, often with great effect, to desert to the communist side. Mao Zedong's self-proclaimed war of national liberation is a series of battles of annihilation. Injuring all of a man's ten fingers is not as effective as chopping off one, and routing ten enemy divisions is not as effective as annihilating one of them. Mao's conquest of mainland China begins with his guerrillas gaining control of the rural areas. Then the cities are surrounded and isolated, engulfed and defeated. for conquest is succeeding just as planned. All along, Mao woos the intellectuals, the middle force in China, with talk of a coalition government, a united front, a new democracy. But Mao's promises of popular representation only mask the communist leader's real intentions. Finally, all of mainland China is swallowed up by the so-called liberation movement, and one-fourth of the world's population is brought under communist control. But on Formosa, renamed Taiwan, more than 10 million Chinese remain free. Chiang Kai-shek has escaped and set up a Republic of China government in opposition to the communists. Chiang signs a mutual defense treaty with the United States and vows one day to liberate captive China. In Beiping, on October 1st, 1949, Mao Zedong proclaims the birth of the People's Republic of China. In communist China, with the war of national liberation won, Mao Zedong reveals to the world that he is no gentle agrarian reformer. In the first five years of the People's Republic, at least 800,000 anti-communists, by Mao's own admission, are tried and executed. Millions more die from local excesses, from imprisonment, from assignment to so-called labor reform units. In foreign affairs, Mao becomes increasingly militant. And in Korea in 1950, communist China and the free world come into conflict when South Korea is invaded by communist forces from North Korea. The United Nations Security Council is convened in emergency session in New York, and the members vote to send troops into combat to help defend the independence and sovereignty of South Korea.
In December 1950, the Red Chinese intervened on the side of North Korea. For two and one half years, the UN and communist troops fight and fall in Korea. The United Nations forces hold, and in July 1953 at Banmunjom, an armistice is signed, fixing boundary lines much as they were when the invasion began. General William Harrison signs for the United Nations. General Nam Il accepts the agreement for North Korea. As the communist Chinese troops withdraw and return to their homeland, Mao Zedong claims a momentous victory over the free world. Mao tells the world, The United States is a paper tiger. Immediately after the establishment of the People's Republic, all is harmony between the Chinese dragon and the Russian bear. Moscow rolls out the red carpet for the visitor from Peking. And it is not long before the two giants of the communist world, controlling together more than a billion lives, sign a 30-year treaty of friendship, alliance, and assistance. Each country promises not to join in any coalition against the other, and both agree to consult regularly on matters of mutual concern. But in 1956, the dragon and the bear come into conflict as Nikita Khrushchev denounces Joseph Stalin, Mao Zedong's longtime idol. When the Russian premier proposes a policy of peaceful coexistence with the free world, Red China attacks Khrushchev and the Soviet Union as traitors to the basic doctrine of world revolution. As the years go by, the rift grows wider. In 1963, Russia, the United States, and Great Britain agree on an historic treaty banning nuclear testing in the atmosphere, outer space, and underwater. The treaty, the increasing contact and communications between Russia and the free world, reflect the Soviet leadership's growing concern with internal problems and so-called peaceful coexistence as a better way than force to spread communism around the world. Dean Rusk signs for the United States. Andrei Gromyko for the Soviet Union. And Alexander Douglas Hume for Great Britain. Red China denounces Moscow's new line and sets out to become the leader of world communism. As generations of leadership change, as years pass, Peking may change its militant position. But today, communist China seeks to spread its own brand of global revolution. Mao's emissaries are sent into the underdeveloped nations of the world, the so-called rural areas. Red technicians arrive in Havana, seeking a foothold in the Caribbean, a satellite in the Western Hemisphere. Raul Castro, Fidel's younger brother, travels behind the bamboo curtain to be greeted and decorated by Chinese military officials. In Europe, Red China wins a satellite in tiny Albania. And in talks and meetings, the Red leaders preach their gospel of world revolution through people's wars of national liberation. 
Satellite nations are emphatically reminded of Mao's admonition. Political power grows out of the barrel of a gun. In Africa, Ghana and its leader, Kwame Nkrumah, received special attention from communist China. On state visits, the Ghanaian president is greeted by Joanne Lai as Peking seeks to spread its influence throughout Africa. In Asia, the Chinese communist regime seeks to become a friend and ally of Pakistan. Zhou Enlai is Peking's apostle of world revolution as he meets with President Ayub Khan. In alliances and agreements with Indonesia and other nations, Red China adheres to Mao Zedong's creed of conquest. The Marxist-Leninist principles of revolution hold good universally for China and for all the other countries of the world. Red China's battle plan is spelled out in specific detail in an article written by Lin Biao, vice chairman of the Chinese Communist Party and Minister of Defense. Long Live the Victory of People's War is the title of the article. And its 18,000 words are directed toward the ultimate and absolute defeat of the free world. Victory for communism will come, says Lin Biao, through wars of national liberation. Country by country, continent by continent. Lin Biao's blueprint for world revolution follows Mao Zedong's classic conquest of China, dividing the world as a nation is divided into cities and rural areas. In this red Chinese battle plan, North America and Western Europe are the cities of the world, and Asia, Africa, Central America, and South America, the rural areas. With revolutions such as the war in Vietnam organized everywhere, there will be, says Lin Biao, a tide of opposition to the free world. And the imperialists, the reactionaries, the Khrushchev revisionists will be swept from the stage of history. The struggle of the Viet Cong, adds Lin Biao, is now the focus of the struggle of the people of the world. Communists are waging a guerrilla war patterned after Mao Zedong's war of national liberation. In South Vietnam, as in China two decades ago, the communists seek to dominate the countryside until the dense thicket of communism surrounds, entangles, and finally chokes the cities. And the Viet Cong fight with guerrilla tactics tested and perfected by Mao Zedong. Use any technique of terror, subversion, treachery that will harass and cripple the enemy. And so civilian prisoners are bound and chained and slaughtered by the Viet Cong. Peking is careful to assert that revolutions cannot be important. But, says Lin Biao, that does not exclude support for revolutionary peoples in their struggles. Thus does militant communist China and Mao Zedong see the day when Peking becomes the ideological center of a world enslaved. But in many countries, the Red Chinese battle plan has failed. In Ghana, Kwame Nkrumah, good friend and faithful ally of Mao Zedong, is today a fallen idol, a deposed ruler, a man without a country. In 
in Indonesia. Anti-communist riots shake the country and students storm the Red Chinese Embassy. Sukarno is no longer the absolute ruler of the island empire. In the Caribbean, communist China suffers still another setback. Fidel Castro turns his back on Peking and sends Red China's technicians home, denouncing all but Castro's own brand of communism. In Asia, nations large and small stand together, strong, alert. Determined to respond to wars of aggression that deny people the chance to decide their own destiny. Striving for peace. Striving for a world in which nations live by law and reason, not by threats and destruction. In a world of so-called cities and rural areas, the emerging nations and industrial countries are today partners in progress, building together for peace. The cities, the fortunate nations of the world, are bringing to the rural areas, the poorer nations, the skills and assistance needed to help them and their people build and create a better life. For this generation and those to come, carrying on a tradition of hope and the dignity of man, a conviction born long ago, far away. When this bell rang out the news that a new nation was born, a new truth proclaimed that man is born to be and to remain forever free.